coming. I'm Brenda. I'm going to jump right in on this. I um I have a lot of information for you this evening. So, like Libby mentioned, um, if you could all hold your questions until the end, uh, I'll be happy to take them in that kind of format. What I tell everybody is that I have a I have a tremendous amount of information, and I can talk about this pretty much forever. So um, I don't want to get off track with some fabulous question and then really y'all going to be late for work tomorrow. So we'll jump right in. Welcome to the graveyard. This is your tour of cemetery art, history, and symbolism with the Gravestone Girls. Uh, there is indeed an S on the end of that. There is Gravestone Girls, more than one. Uh, our mission is to keep our dead alive by preserving cemetery art and history. So shameless self-promotion with the website in the upper left-hand corner on our logo there, www.gravestonegirls.com. Uh, you can also find our pages on Facebook and Instagram under Gravestone Girls. Uh, this picture in the lower right-hand corner here are the three original GGs in their natural habitat. The beauty standing there and on the left is Melissa, my web mistress, Zipora, she keeps us looking good on the internet. That is me to her left, over here on your right, my right, I can never tell. I'm the one standing with the sunglasses and the purple boots and seated is my unconventional conventionalist, Maggie. Um, she also works behind the scenes to keep us going. Uh, Melissa grew up out in Western Massachusetts. Maggie and I grew up in Central Massachusetts. And together and separately, we have been traversing graveyards all over the world for most of our lives. And Greystone Girls do a bunch of different things. We do public presentations like this to talk about the things we find in everybody's backyards and their main streets when it comes to gravestones and cemeteries. We have physical walking tours out in the fresh air and out in the open to see what's liter literally and physically on the landscape. Um, we teach gravestone rubbing classes, and I'm not going to speak about that tonight, but except to say that there is a lot of misconception about gravestone rubbing. Uh, some people think it's illegal, some people think it's dangerous, some people think it shouldn't be done at all, and we are ad advocates for proper gravestone rubbing techniques. Uh, to do a gravestone rubbing properly, and that is the key, you need to know a little bit before you go out, you need to practice good habits and be safe. Uh, but to do a, a properly executed gravestone rubbing is to create a document of a gravestone at a particular point in time, because they do actually change, even though we think they might, because we're so used to them being out on the landscape for many, many, many years. So the gravestone rubbing that we started doing just for ourselves and our own entertainment a long time ago led to the creation of gravestone replicas as well. So we make copies of the real thing that is still located on the cemetery landscapes all over New England, mostly from the faces of colonial gravestones. And uh, the walk I'm going to take you for tonight is gonna show you uh, those kind of objects that we work with. So you can, you can see our artwork at the website, gravestonegirls.com. Um, we make things to hang on the wall, magnets, coasters, pin boards, frames, mirrors, all kinds of, of fun and decorative objects using those old colonial gravestones as our launching pad, as our palette. All right, that is enough fabulousness about the gravestone girls. There will be more later. Do not worry about it. Uh, before we get started on the evolutionary part of the program, we actually need to answer two questions about the origin and the evolution of cemeteries. And those questions are, why do we bury the dead and where do gravestones come from? So the archeological and anthropological record dating back 50,000 or more years is repeatedly shown that different societies and different civilizations have believed in the concept that there is another world after this. So that upper right corner shows a grave and in the grave with the remains are some grave goods. And those grave goods are things that might be needed for the next world. 
So they, those, those very simple vessels might have contained something uh, like oils or food, beads, other things that might be needed by the occupant. And we, we bury our dead in graves because they are, you know, we are mortal. So we only have a little bit of time while we're here. And once we die, we have to do something with the remains. So we do what we have here on that upper right-hand corner. We dig a hole, we put the body in the ground. And originally we covered that body with many stones. And that's where the word grave stone originates from. So it is the idea that we, we mark that grave with stones for a couple of reasons. One would be to know where you put someone in the event you want to go back and visit. It also serves a purpose that you know where you put someone when it comes time to put someone else in the ground after their death so that you do not disturb the folks that are already there. And it early on, it served the very practical purpose of keeping wild animals from disturbing the body in that freshly turned earth. So it kept it covered. So if we take that idea and go a little bit further looking at the picture on the lower right hand corner, aren't those big pointy things really just big old gravestones? They are, they are gravestones that mark the spot where Pharaoh is buried and in that burial chamber, in that grave is are contained objects wonderful things that Pharaoh needs for his journey to the next world. Now I can talk about 50,000 years worth of history, no problem, but we do not have that kind of time. So I'm gonna get to the good stuff. I'm gonna get to the stuff that are in our own backyards and on our main streets all around the New England area. So in the upper left-hand corner is the illustration of a very, regular, ordinary, commonly found colonial burial ground, graveyard, uh, sometimes churchyard, but that's another conversation uh, from the colonial period. So the colonial period is from first settlement in the 1600s and into the 1700s. In the upper right hand corner, that landscape is very indicative of the rural garden movement of the 19th century. And then the third period with a landscape and the ideology change completely is found in the lower right hand corner. And that is a very good example and a very common example of our modern cemeteries of the 20th and 21st centuries. So this is a very standard colonial New England burial ground. Remember burying ground, uh, graveyard, uh, sometimes churchyard, it's going to depend on your religious background. Uh, the, the, the settlers of the time, so our, our Puritans are building meeting houses and they're putting graveyards or burial grounds in close proximity to those, to that meeting house. Um, if you are English, if you are Anglican, part of the Anglican church, they're building churches and they're putting churchyards next to the churches. So when you go into an old New England town, it is very common to find these spaces. So if you've never been to an old New England town and you are looking for the old burial ground, what you should do is look for Main Street, look for the original city center or town center, uh, look for the historic district, district, which would be one of the oldest parts, if not the oldest part, of town. And if all of that fails, look up in the sky and see if you can see that white steeple like we see here. Uh, that church might have been an Anglican church and you may have an English, uh, English burial ground or uh, typically and more likely, particularly as you get outside of the Boston area, you're going to have that church will often sit on the remains of the original meeting house. And if it's not a church, it might be town hall or it might be city hall. That meeting house was part of the requirements for establishing a town, for getting a charter in New England in the 17th century. So you put in a meeting house and you were also required to put in a burial ground. So that's why you will often find them in very close proximity to each other. So once you find this space, when you, when you get to this area, when you get to this old graveyard, know that what you've seen is absolutely changed over time. 
And we think of that as a very strange thing. We, these are sacred spaces. Why would they change? They change for a whole lot of reasons. They change because they are located in the center of town. So over time, we put in roads where there were no roads before, or we expand existing roads. We build buildings, and we expand existing buildings. And all of that eats into the landscape. Uh, my, groundskeeping affects how these places are laid out. The idea of sanitation, the idea of not having your, and at the time they were unembalmed and, and, and uh, not vaulted and, and not all sealed up the way we do it now. You've got, you've got the idea of the miasma that these old graveyards may have been putting out into the air and possibly the idea that they possibly made people sick. Um, you wanted to, to move that unpleasant and often unkept visual out of sight. So you may either, uh, they may have at any given point in time, taken these burial grounds and laid them flat and covered them over, or they may have moved the stones and or the bodies um, off to another location on what at the time would have been the outskirts of town. And when I say all of these things that are happening, they are happening in, in every century. Uh, you also get people that come along at just different points of time from an aesthetic point of view, and they say, this place is a mess. We got to clean it up. So all of those factors over the hundreds of years that these spaces have been out there, they all contribute to what we see now. This very organized, nice, neat rows, very pleasing to the eye, a very organized graveyard. So know that all of those things over time have been factors in the landscape that is presented to us today. This is the anatomy of a gravestone. This is very much a very typical colonial New England slate gravestone. So gravestones have parts over here on the left. This little roundy over here is called the shoulder. And then this lunette where the art is contained is the tympanum. And then we have another shoulder over here. Below the art in this tablet, we will have the biographical information. So names, dates, ages, um, maybe where they're from, maybe where they died, uh, if we're really lucky, cause of death. And colonial New England gravestones are typically slate. They might be brownstone uh, or other local materials. But within Massachusetts, if you were gonna take Massachusetts and basically split it in half, round about the Worcester area, or maybe a little farther west of Worcester, out in the Brookfield area. If you go from the center of the state all the way to the sea, this is what you're typically going to see in a colonial New England gravestone. You're going to see it made out of slate material. If you go from middle of the state out west to the edge of the state, Western Mass, and down into Connecticut, that material, that local material for gravestones is typically going to be sandstones. So it might be brown sandstone, red sandstone. People were using material that was local as building materials and also for gravestone materials. You had to, you didn't have a lot of roads. You were traveling by horse and cart. You had to get this stuff out of the ground. Then you had to move it back to where it was going to be worked. Then it was worked into a gravestone and then it was put on the landscape where you see it. So you don't want to travel a very far distance because there's a lot working against you to get the job done. Uh, and Massachusetts uh, and New England in general, because Maine and, um, was part of all the way up through New Hampshire and into Maine, what are those states now? They're also very rich in slate deposits as well. So slate is, a, is sediment that it's a, a sandy, display or a, a sandy deposit uh, of muds and clays that get those layers build up and then they get crushed together by the forces of the earth that create a very uh, durable, very weather resistant material that was still relatively easy to get out of the ground and easy to work with mallet and chisel. And because of that geological construction, 
that they are so weather resistant. That is why so many of them look so good today. Even stones that were done much later than these slates of the 17th and 18th century, the 19th, many 19th century stones don't look as good because of their geological material. And yet these guys, uh, this one is dated, uh, got a death date of 1699. And it certainly looks almost brand new. So gravestones originally came in two parts. We have headstones and we have footstones. So over here on the left, this row are headstones. These little guys are footstones. So they were your bed for eternity. They gave you, they, they were someplace where you went after you died, you went into the ground in this bed for eternity. And if, it, if you were six feet tall, you buried father, he's six feet tall. There's a six foot spread between his headstone and his footstone. You bury mother next to him and she's five feet tall. So there was a five foot spread between her headstone and footstone. So if you take that logic and you apply it to this, to this slide, to this picture, everybody in this picture that they buried, they were all the same height, right? Nope. You know what this is? This is another visual cue for you that the landscape has changed. Isn't that space between the large stones on the left and the smaller foot stones on the right, isn't that about the right size for the lawnmower to go through? Do you wanna be the guy that has to mow around all these big and little stones? You have to keep the landscape efficiently. There's not a lot of money to go around. There's not a lot of manpower to go around. So over time, if we're lucky, those little footstones get pushed out and they make their own row like we see here. If we're lucky, they get tucked up over here behind the parent stone. Uh, and if we're not so lucky, then uh, off they go. So they can end up in all kinds of places and headstones as well for that matter. Um, they end up in walkways, stone walls, patios, windowsills. We've seen them propping up other gravestones. Um, it, is, it, it is less the idea of being sacrilegious or, or desecrating and part more the idea that we're just good Yankees and we, we want to, we, do, we don't waste. So we will find another purpose for something when we are done with it. And truly the idea of historic preservation, the way we, think about it today in the 20th, late 20th and 21st century, really only came into, into the mainstream around the 1960s with the destruction of Penn Station. And once that magnificent building in New York was lost, we all went, oh my God, what have we done? And we recognized that we needed to do a better job of being stewards of our, of our art architecture and history. And then that applies so that trickle down thing applies into these graveyard spaces as well. So you will know a footstone when you see one because they are smaller. And if we were to look at these two in the front, so here's the tall headstone. So if that headstone is mine and it has my name on it, Brenda P. Sullivan, then the stone, the little one, the footstone directly behind it should bear my name or my initials or something that ties the big one to the little one. If this little stone directly behind this big one says somebody else's name or somebody else's initials that don't match the big stone, it's just another visual cue for you to recognize that yes, again, this is the, the results of the, the landscape being changed around over time. Back in the colonial period, they were very superstitious. They were very religious. They were really, um, really following the Bible to the letter. And they understood that life was very difficult and that you could be here one minute and gone the next. So you had to be prepared. And that extends into how you were buried in the ground. And if you'll notice at the top of this slide over here on the left, I've indicated west. And over here on the right, I've indicated east. And what it is, is the orientation, the way the stones are, are oriented on the ground, in the ground, in the cemetery, uh, in the graveyard, 
I'm lazy with my language. They're not cemeteries yet, uh, but nowadays we do use graveyard, burial ground, cemetery, and the like interchangeably. But really, these are still in the 17th and 18th century, these are still firmly burial grounds and, and old graveyards. So even the way you are oriented, the way your grave and your stones were facing in these old graveyards were important. So what we're looking at with these big stones over here on the left, where my pointer is, that face on this side, facing left or facing west, is where the inscription is. The body is here behind the stone. So the idea that the body is here behind the stone because on Judgment Day, the Archangel Gabriel is going to come from the east. He is going to sound the call with his trumpet to Judgment Day and Resurrection, and all of the dead are going to sit up in their graves facing east to meet their maker. It was an important call. You were not, you did not want to miss this call. You did not do all the work that you did here trying to get on to the next world after your death to then be put incorrectly in the ground and maybe not hear the call of the trumpet at all or to rise up at the call and be facing in the wrong direction, which if it was anything but east, you're facing the wrong direction and you may get left behind and you may not be able to make that trip to the next world. So they're very literal with all of this interpretation. So keep that in mind when you go into these old graveyards, know where east and west is. Are the stones still oriented this way from the colonial period? If they are, it will show you that they're still oriented in the original ways, even though maybe their footstones have been shifted to these other locations, new rows or out or behind or taken away altogether. Um, but if these stones, if these colonial stones, if those headstones in particular are not on that east-west axis orientation with the writing facing west and the, the blank side facing east, then that's just another indicator for you that this space has indeed been changed over time. So these are all, these colonial gravestones, they're symbols their orientation, everything about them. They are all Christian-based iconography and ideology. So on the left, I've got a pretty handsome devil there. I've got a winged skull. It's called a death's head. And it is the idea of the soul. And early on, remember I said people were very religious, very superstitious, and very literal in their biblical interpretation. Life is really hard in the 17th and 18th century from the time we get here and going forward. You spend every day just trying to survive. Keep a roof over your head, stay dry, have a place to sleep, have enough to eat, keep yourselves alive, keep clothes on your back, keep your livestock alive, keep your vegetable gardens growing. Being able to practice your trade to make money so that you can you and your family can continue to survive. So every little thing that you did counted towards the care and feeding of that immortal soul. And here that death head was created on gravestones to give the living a, a visual cue about mortality and morality. So we use here the skull and the bones to show the idea of mortality, that that is all that's left once you die. So at the time, because of the religious belief system, the idea of biblically of carving something into stone that looked human or angelic would have been considered a graven image and would have been sacrilegious. So this death's head shows that idea about mortality in the proper way for the time. Uh, you put wings on that skull and there is that idea of the immortal soul making its flight to the next world. Uh, I call it a scared straight program. It is meant to be scary and creepy. Uh, it is meant to be that quick visual cue to the living to check their behavior and make sure that what they're doing here is worthy of being, when being judged 
at the end of time on Judgment Day to get to the next world. So I just said that carving something that looks angelic or human into a stone was sacrilegious. Well, on the left, my winged skull is indeed the proper symbol of the time. So they start coming in last half or really even a little bit later, the last quarter of the 1600s here in New England. And then as we get into the 1720s and 30s, uh, there is a backlash against the hyper-religiosity of the time, that very, very liberal interpretation that every little transgression might be the difference between fire and brimstone and, and, and harps and, and angels. So that wings, you still have to continuously impress upon the people the idea of the, the care and feeding of the immortal soul. So that wing skull that we see up in the left around the 1720s and going forward, that wing skull is allowed to grow some skin and take on a human or angelic reference without running the risk of being blasphemous. And it still means the same thing. It still is that visual cue to the living to check their, their morality because their, their mortality and, and the results of their mortality depend on that behavior. It means exactly the same thing, but it is just the more modern symbol for the time. And there is no time when you can say, the wing skull stopped being used in 1726. That's just not how it works. Uh, you don't always get a gravestone when you die. You may get it a year later, five years later, 30 years later, if you get one at all. And it might be backdated, it might be pre-carved, with a with art on it that you then just had the lettering and the biographical information filled in. An older person might be buying it for a younger person and that older person might be steeped in the older traditions and vice versa with the young people. So there is a lot of influence that goes on in the choosing of a gravestone and the imagery that is seen on it for the iconography. So. You, that's the reason why you can't just say, we don't see any more winged skulls after a certain date and they're all just winged souls going forward. Uh, I've seen gravestones with death dates right up to the end of the 1700s, 1801, 1802 even, uh, that, that has a winged skull on it, which would be well after, that it was, after the time where it was a very commonly used symbol. So know that these two images for the soul, this soul symbol are always going to ebb and flow through that 150 year period. I wanted to show you some other lovelies too, and this is but a few, of course, but there's some of the some of the lovely ones that we see here in New England. I could do a whole program just on the, the different art of the wing skulls that are found on stones, but I wanted to share some of those. And I also wanted to share some of the wing souls as well. So I've got a whole bunch of different looking faces here. They might look human. They might look a bit angelic. They might look a bit cartoony. They are all different. And I think the most important thing here to note is that the faces that you're looking at here are not meant to be the individuals that are in the grave. So the faces that you see on each of these stones are not the occupants, not the individual that is part, uh, that that gravestone was carved and erected for. Um, carvers carved in particular styles. Some of them evolved their styles over time. Some had apprentices that learned under them that then went and carved in a similar style. And uh, some, some carved the same style through their entire careers while others did evolve over time. So know that this is much more the idea of being the universal symbol about mortality and morality and not about the individual. There are other images on gravestones as well, not just those, not just those uh, soul symbols. In the upper left, I've got a very simple star. Sometimes they're six pointed, sometimes they're eight pointed. They're often called hexafoils. They are, hexafoils are often considered to be protection. Um, they are also very easy to use, to create from a carving point of view. Uh, they are a nice adornment. And if they are 
if they are considered to be stars, they might be the idea that stars show up at dusk in the evening as the sun sets, and they are still out as we make the transition from night into day. And to the right of that is a really lovely sun symbol. So we see these on gray stones as well. Uh, they are really, truly the idea that it is neither a rising nor a setting sun, it is both. So it is the sun setting on this life because that is inevitable, but it is also the promise of the sun rising on the next life. In the lower left-hand corner, I've got a beautiful winged soul there and uh, over one of its wings, I've got an hourglass. So everyone was born with an hourglass. You had a certain amount of sand in that hourglass. You did not know how much sand you had. You did not know how long that glass was going to run. And you did not know when that last grain of sand was going to fall. So it was the idea of being prepared all the time, checking your behavior, correcting your behavior, doing good and virtuous work while you are here. We often see images on gravestones of that hourglass with wings on it. So literally you put wings on the hourglass and it is literally the idea that time flies. Floating above that winged soul's head is crossbones. So we still use crossbones today. We use skull and crossbones. We know the pirates use them. We use them for, for poison, for high voltage, a visual cue for danger. And that is just another symbol thrown in there on that gravestone to show the idea of mortality and the perils of bad deeds in this world will be revisited on you in the next world. And a fun fact with those crossbones, when you see them, they are the long bones of your upper legs. Part of a gravestone that we start to see as the, as the 17th century draws to a close, we get this extra part that shows up underneath the biographical information on the gravestone. And it's called an epitaph. So it might be one or two lines, three or four lines. It might be longer. Uh, it is a message again to the living about mortality and morality from the dead. And it is not the idea that I write my husband's epitaph on his gravestone, not in the colonial period. It is about, it is the idea that I am going to draw from something, the epitaph will draw from something that is well known and easily recognized to the folks who can read and write. So it might become, uh, it might come from a biblical passage, it might be part of a hymn, it might be part of contemporary literature. The pictures are on the stones to easily be a quick visual cue to the living about mortality and morality, and you reach the folks that can read and write and just remind them to be mindful, but you also are reaching the folks that cannot read at all. So a very commonly seen epitaph that we find along the, along the graveyards of the Northeast. Uh, this, is a, this is a bit of a, an alteration, but it, it all works the same way. Uh, this one reads, Stand full reader, spend a tear over the dust that slumbers here. And whilst you're musing here on me, think on the glass that runs for a day. We have pictures on gravestones, we have written words on gravestones, and we have Latin on gravestones as well. And in the upper left, I've got death, I've got father time. He's sitting on your tomb with his scythe and the hourglass. And that Latin phrase reads memento mori. Think on death, remember your mortality. So over and over and over, this, this is a constant puritanical finger wag about checking your behavior, watching what you're doing. Everything that you do counts on whether or not you get your reward in the next world. And the opposite to Father Time, I've got a beautiful colonial New England brownstone. So that's one of those sandstones I was talking about that we often see in Western Mass and down in Connecticut coming, uh, material coming out of the Connecticut River Valley. And across the top of that is a very fancy uh, long Latin phrase. And that's fabulous, but I don't need to know Latin in the 17th century or the 21st century to understand that picture. 
So what's going on here is that is a tree, this guy right here. That's a tree, there's the tree stump, you're the tree. A human life is just like a tree. It has a definite beginning, it has a definite end, and it's a fragile life. That life can be interrupted at any time. And what's happening here is a sudden interruption. Coming out of the clouds of heaven, coming out of the clouds of the sky, is the arm of your maker with his hatchet and he fells your tree. You didn't know it was coming. You didn't know when it was coming, but today is the day and hope you were ready. The last of your opportunities to, to care for that immortal soul and send it on its way has been used. But don't worry, read on down here, lightly scribed across the top of this beautiful old slate gravestone says the grave is God's hiding place. So the grave is kind of like God's waiting room. It is where we hang out because that bed for eternity, we're there, we're waiting for something. We are waiting for that big day. The goal here is to hear the sound of Gabriel's trumpet, calling the calling the the dead to rise for resurrection on judgment day to be redeemed of their sins and to ascend to the next world below this photo here that guy in the middle that skull that is death and it is mortality and what it says on either side on that banner all must submit to the king of terrors. Death was known as the king of all terrors and no one gets out of here alive. We thought some guy in the 1960s came up with that line, but yeah, they knew that 300 years before that. But not to worry, keep reading. It says through Christ, we conquer, rise and reign forever. The promise that there is more after this world and the trials and tribulations we stand under while we are here, we will be rewarded for with eternal life in the next world. As we get into the end of the 1700s and moving firmly into the 1800s, as the 1700s draws to a close, there's a lot going on. We have a revolution. We tell the king across the pond, hey, thanks. It's been great, but you know what? We're gonna strike out on our own and we are going to rule ourselves. So we are going to start a new nation and we are off. So we go through the revolution and as we come out of it and we've got this new nation, the, the founding fathers are trying to, to build ideologies for us. What are we? Who are we? What do we stand for as a new nation? So they look at the very successful and the very ancient civilizations of the Greeks and the Romans, who were the founders of the concepts of the Republic and democracy, the idea of the people governing themselves, not a monarch, not someone else above them. The people are, are the ones in charge of their destinies. So while they are having that ideological conversation during nation building, um, as we come out of the 1700s, there's a lot of real time archeology span going on over in Europe. So uh, Greece is being, being uh, excavated. Uh, places like Pompeii and Herculaneum are coming to light. The far reaches of the Roman outposts all across the continent are coming to light. Um, through the task of archaeology. So artifacts, structures, buildings, both grand and, and daily life objects are coming to life. And we are seeing the people from thousands of years before us of how they lived in these classical civilizations. So people are going on the grand tour to see it. Uh, archaeologists and others are collecting these objects and bringing them back to this country. And What's happened, what's happening is it is influencing the land of the living. So it affects our architecture, our furniture. We have federal style furniture. We have, we are building architecture that look like temples with triangular pediments and columns. We have um, 
We have influence on fashion and hairstyles. We're all drawing on this classic, on these classic civilizations, which is now when it's used in the 18th century, it's called neoclassicism. So the thing that happens, all these things are happening in the land of the living. And the thing that happens in the land of the dead is this urn. So what's happening here is in those excavation, one of the things that's coming to light are these cinerary urns. So they are actually being taken out of the ground and they were coming from, uh, cremation was being done at the time, thousands of years ago. And also often when you died, you were taken to the outskirts of the city, left to naturally decay if you weren't cremated. And either way, those remains were eventually put in a vessel in this type of cinerary urn. And that cinerary urn you know, is that physical object, that object that's coming out of the ground that we are then looking at as modern people of the time and saying, well, that really works for us. We, we are not about these skulls and crossbones and these hourglasses and these axes. No, no, no. This is a modern interpretation of who we are and, and our belief system and uh, our mortality and morality. So that urn starts showing up on gravestones. And here we actually have it in a niche that might be considered a columbarium or, or some sort of funerary interment. We also get trees like this. This is a very specific tree. So this is a weeping willow. So by virtue of the way it looks and its name, it's a perfect object to be used in funerary culture to denote mourning and sorrow. And again, trees are like people. They have a definite beginning, they have a definite end, and that life can be interrupted at any time. That life is fragile. And what we have here is a willow that has indeed been split, that life is interrupted, has been interrupted. But if you look here at the split, what's happening is a new life is starting to grow from that split. So there is that visual cue, that promise that there will be more after this. So the dominant symbol as we move into the 1800s is the urn and the willow, both separately and together like this one down here, which become the very dominant, very common motif for the gravestones of the 19th century. This looks really different, doesn't it? We have now moved out of the colonial period. We have moved firmly into the 19th century. And this is the first time we have a place where we bury our dead that's called a cemetery. This is Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a Cambridge Watertown line. And it is, it is, called a cemetery, again, drawing off that neoclassicism, the idea, uh, even the word cemetery comes from a Greek word that means sleeping place or dormitory. And it really reflects the idea of how the modern people of the time feel about death. So they have, uh, it is, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on here. Uh, we are moving from being an agricultural society to being an industrialized nation. So we're leaving the farms, we're moving into the cities. We're working in the factories in these cities and the work is still hard, but we're not spending all of our time just trying to survive. We've got money, the mechanizations from these factories are producing goods. So it's making it easier to, to survive. We're not spending all of our time just trying to get through every day. Um, we have the, the poets and the writers like Hawthorne and Thoreau and Longfellow that are writing about communing with nature, preserving nature, getting out and enjoying nature. We have the spiritualists and the transcendentalists of the 19th century that are having conversations with the spirit world. We're having seances and Ouija boards. We're doing spirit photography. We believe that yes, there is absolutely another world after this, but it's it's easy to access to the ones that went before us. Uh, it is like stepping through the veil, walking through, easily stepping from one room to another to make the transition to the next eternal world. 
So all of that ideology comes together here in Mount Auburn Cemetery. Mount Auburn Cemetery was established in 1831 by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. It was indeed meant to be a place to bury the dead. It was taking its cues from places like Père Lachaise in Paris, and also the idea of the English garden style, uh, as it was also considered at the time to be a, a, uh, an arboretum. It was a test arboretum of the time. So absolutely everything changes. Green grass, rolling hills, trees, there are water features. In this, in this new cemetery, pathways to walk. Those pathways are named Petunia Path and Olive Grove and Elm Street, and very much taking the idea of nature and incorporating it even into the names of the places and the features in this space. The monuments are different shapes and sizes. They are different material. We'll talk about the changes in that material with some of our future examples coming up. So all of this stuff comes together to create green space, a really uh, something when this place, when Mount Auburn was open, it was a tourist attraction, exactly the same as it and many of, of its fellow, fellow cemeteries of the 19th century are as well. It was a place to come and see something brand new. This is a new invention. This is a newfangled space. And it is also green space, open green space. It is an oasis four miles outside of dirty, filthy downtown industrialized 19th century Boston. And very quickly, this idea of the cemetery comes into play in many towns around the New England area. So very quickly, towns are expanding their existing spaces or establishing new spaces and creating their own cemeteries. And many times you will be able to tell a 19th century rural garden cemetery in New England or really around the country by its name. It will be called Woodlawn, Forest Lawn, Elm, Elmwood, uh, Spring Grove, Laurel Hill. They're all going to have these very nature oriented uh, very euphemistic names. And you have in these newfangled cemeteries, you have for the first time the ability to purchase a plot of land. So I call it a vacation home, a summer home, your home away from home. It is the first time where a living family can purchase a piece of land in a cemetery and make it a place where one by one, the family members, as they pass from this world to the next, they go to this family plot, they go to this second home, and they will all eventually be brought back together. And we may make this space, we may make these family plots very ornamental. Uh, in the upper left, um, that family plot has got coping around it. So it's got a basically a foundation. We can see the four square sides of this space that make the foundation of this home. It has a front door right there. It's got a couple of steps that go right up the stairs and through that front door, if you will, and into your own family plot. So this idea of the family plot becomes very popular. And if you look at the photo at the bottom here on the lower right, now I've got a family plot. Here's another one, here's another one. Across the street, here's another one, here's another one. So now very quickly, that cemetery and those family plots really create a neighborhood. These are places that were very, uh, very well-traveled. They were very popular. You came to these spaces very regularly. You picnicked here, you planted flowers here, you visited with your living neighbors who were also here doing the same thing, remembering their family. Um, you were communing with the dead, you were communing with nature. And one of the other things is the dead were very mobile at this time as well. So families saw this new fangled cemetery and the ability to have this family plot as a way to bring a family back together. And it would not be uncommon to take your dead from these older colonial burial grounds and move them into your new family plot, uh, as well as 
many of these spaces would would be changed and moved around necess necessitating you collecting your dead and bringing them on with you uh, i call it moving up to the east side everybody comes back together in th this space symbols much softer here and these are but a few again i could have a whole program just on victorian symbolism so we've got the tree tree monument over here they, they're called tree stumps um, because they look like trees. Um, they are, they can be very simple. They can be very elaborate. And they will often have their bark peeled away like this so that they you can read the words inscribed on the tree. Now, this is not wood. This is stone. Death is much more pleasant. No more hatchets coming out of the sky. The angels come and carry you softly, easily out of your bed and carry you to the next world. We have flowers on gravestones, just like we have trees. So the idea of human life, like flowers, are the idea that the flower that starts, then the bud that blooms, and then the bloom that fades. So here is an example. I've got full blooms here, a life fully realized. I've got a bend and a break, an interruption in that stem, the end of that life. Often when you see flowers like this, but they're still in the bloom, they're still the bud. It is very often for small children and young women, uh, the idea of nipped in the bud, the idea of the life that never gets to be fully realized, the bud that never blooms. And while we're talking about flowers, I wanted to include this because I see these often on the landscapes uh, in, in a multitude of places around the country and very much overseas in Europe as well. So these are called cradle graves, this photo down here in the lower right. And it's called a cradle grave um, because of the way it looks, because it looks like a cradle, but they were not used just for children. They are the idea that you could plant flowers here. And this is an act of visiting. This is an act of maintenance. This is an act of remembering. You are going there to visit your loved one and beautify their grave and therefore the landscape, making the cemetery a very interactive place between the living, the dead, and nature. I actually know a place in Philadelphia where they probably have about, I would say, 100 or so of these cradle graves. And there's a garden society that, to this day, um, every spring goes in and they plant in those cradles and the flowers bloom all across the landscape all summer long and into the fall and it's really really beautiful other 19th century messages remember these are modern messages for the time they're still they're still saying exactly the same thing as the colonials about the next world and something else beyond this uh, it is just the more modern symbol of the time, symbols of the time. So here I have the pointing finger, sort of got a cloud around his wrist. Uh, this is the way home. This is, I'm, I'm, I've left this world. I'm going to go to the next world. I'll see you there. You know, more phrases, uh, parted below, united above. We shall meet again, and of course, gone but not forgotten. The, the, the person may have physically died and left this world, but they're on the other side and they're waiting and we will all be brought back together again. That pointing finger is absolutely no different than the wing skull that we saw from the colonial period. It is pointing the way to the next world. And again, it is just the more modern symbol from the time, for the time of the 19th century. So we have shaking hands here that say farewell. We have shaking hands down here that say reunited, the act of being brought back together. And sometimes you can even see, we've got a, a feminine cuff over here on the left in the bottom reunited picture. And then we've got a more masculine cuff over here. And very often when you have a, a feminine and a masculine hand clasping like that, we very often have uh, matrimony, symbols of a married couple. I wanted you to know about this too. So some people's vacation homes are just nicer than others. This is a mausoleum. 
This is a freestanding building, just like any other vacation home. And this is not a bad place to spend eternity, right? Nice cul-de-sac, the ground's well-maintained, the neighbors are quiet. This is very much neoclassical architecture. We've got a pe triangular pediment at the top. Whoop, go back. Triangular pediment at the top. I've got a keystone in my architecture. I've got Corinthian capitals. I've got columns. And what I've got of this beautiful facade, the family would arrive in their carriage. They would walk up the lawn. They would ascend the stairs. They held keys to those beautiful bronze doors and they opened the doors and they let themselves inside. And the, the doors open to a chamber, open the door to the house, just like you would walk into your own front door. Uh, it would have vaults. Uh, and in this case, we can kind of see the illusion of that here. I've got these three blocks, one, two, three here, one, two, three, there, that's part of the exterior architecture and it just happens to correspond with three lateral vaults on either side, one, two, three, one, two, three. So when you walk through the door, the vaults containing the caskets of your beloveds are on either side. You went in here, you swept up, you put flowers in the, in the vases, there might be a table and chairs in there. You sit in there, you do the memento mori thing. You think about mortality. You think about the people that have gone before. You might read your novel. You might read the newspaper. You might read the newspaper to your deceased so that they can keep up with what's going on since they left. This again is a very interactive space between the living and the dead. Then one other thing I want you to know here. So on the doors, this color that you see is light coming through a window on the opposite side, on the back side of this structure, and it's stained glass. Very often that stained glass will have a motif of uh, the outside. It might have a pond and trees uh, and flowers, the idea of bringing the outdoors in. Uh, it might have a religious motif to show the idea of faith in the next world. It is the idea of having a window in a structure just like you would any other structure for the living and you let the light from the outside in to fill the chamber. I wanted you to know about these two just quickly. Um, this is, these monuments when you see them, they are called white bronzes. They are affectionately known as Zinkies. They were made by the Monumental Bronze Company in Bridgeport, Connecticut from about the mid 1800s until about the 19 teens. So when you look at these, you go, hmm, that doesn't look white to me. And they are not. They are a pale bluish gray and they are not bronze either. They are molten zinc, almost 100% pure that has been smelted at the foundry, poured into molds and then the molded pieces put together to make the monuments you see on the landscape. The monumental bronze was in direct competition with the, the stone monument makers, the, the marble and granite monument makers of the time, and um, as well as the bronze monument makers of the time. So this is a time when bronze is being used on the cemetery landscape for vases and doors and statuary plaques. Uh, they very much communicate the idea of, of having some money and what Monumental Bronze Company said was, well, we're going to make a newfangled monument. We're going to make it out of this other material. We're going to call it white bronze to capitalize on the cachet of the word bronze, but differentiate it by calling it white bronze. And the idea was that zinc is a natural biocide and it does not need any kind of maintenance. It will not grow any lichens or algaes or mosses or molds. It does not need any upkeep. And the promise was that it would look as good on the landscape in the future as it did the day it was put out there, which is pretty much true to this day. Um, I've got the Statue of Hope over here on the left. She's got her anchor right there. And then this is an example of a, a central monument in a family plot and then little white bronze uh, headstones marking each one of the graves. There were no stores for this. You didn't buy them through the Sears catalog. You didn't go to the, the shopping center and, and see the, a physical uh, retail display. 
they were sold by people with design books that were typically moonlighting, making to make more money, uh, second income. And you could choose whatever you wanted from the design books. And if they didn't have the design, they could make it for you. And so they still cost some money. Uh, they were less than bronze. They didn't need the maintenance and they were newfangled. So you were very modern if you had one of these on your family plot. If you go into a cemetery somewhere where there are a lot of these, or you go into a town where there are a lot of these, you had a very good salesman. If you go into a cemetery town that have very few or, or none at all, you didn't have such a good salesman. This is our third period. We're winding up with the modern landscape. So as we move into the close of the 1800s and inched firmly into the 20th century, there's a lot more transition, a lot big, a lot of big changes coming. Um, there is a backlash against all the heavy ornamental, heavy sentimentality that marked the Victorian period. We want to get back to basics. There's an arts and crafts movement that simplifies in the land of the living, our architecture, our furniture, our, our hairstyles, our, our style of dress. We want to keep, we want to go back to basics. So we want to keep that cemetery landscape. We want to bring that back to basics as well. We want to make the landscape easier on the eye, more pastoral, take away from that busy frenetic visual that was the particularly the high Victorian cemetery as, as the 1800s come to a close. We have new material available. Um, these monuments are made out of granite. So we now have the tools, water powered tools, steam powered tools, uh, and later electrical powered tools uh, to, to get this very hard rock that comes from the molten core of the earth. We have the tools to get it out of the ground to be used not just to make big grand buildings and statuary, but for more mundane articles such as the daily use and the common consumption of gravestones. We have the need to be efficient in our groundskeeping. There's not a lot of money to do this. So money and manpower again. So we want to make it easy to landscape and keep this space looking good. There are two really big things that happen that also influence this new modern landscape of the 20th century. And one of them is at, as, as, as the result of the Civil War, we have started to embalm our dead. So we embalm our dead to keep them fresh, fresh, if you will, to, to be able to, to transport the dead from the Civil War home. But it then makes its way into death care of the modern time. So we stop, uh, perhaps we stop dying at home. We go more to hospitals and facilities as the 1800s move on and certainly firmly into the 1900s. We stop having wakes and funerals in our own home. Our families stop caring for their own deceased. We give that job to the funeral director and we go to the funeral parlor where once, once we have, when someone dies, we turn them over very quickly to the funeral director who then does his best to take that body and, and make it, dress it and make it look as living as much as the living person is as possible. So we stop dealing with death and our mortality the way the people of the, the Victorian and the colonials before us did. And certainly modern medicine as we have rocketed through the 20th century and into the 21st century, we have learned a tremendous amount in less than, less, well, less than 200 years. And we are, we have modern medicine in penicillin and we understand germ theory and we understand we have antibiotics. And if you get a cut, you put some antibiotic medicine on it and you keep your hands clean and you won't die of gangrene and, and lose an arm at the very least or lose your life at the very most. Um, we have, I mean, if you even think within the last, just let's call it 50 years, organ transplants, uh, 
we have mapped the human genome. We are doing genetic engineering. We are coming up with vaccines to, to combat a, pan, a global pandemic in less than 18 months through science. So medicine moves from the end of the 1800s and into the 1900s. It moves from being art and a little side of magic to being science. And we are extending our life far beyond we, where we ever would have thought. Uh, we beat death on a very regular basis through science and modern medicine. So we stay out of this space more often than the people that came before us. So this has become a, a, a place where we didn't go so much and we didn't talk about so much and the stones reflected that. And the good news is I would say within the last 25 or 30 years or so, particularly with the increase in the use of black granite, um, but also just a desire for the individuals and the families that put gravestones up for their loved ones. They have decided that they wanna talk about who these people were, who were we as individuals, who were we as family members, we, what did we enjoy while we were here? And this is but a few examples of, of the modern messages that I see on gravestones that give me insight to that individual that I may very well have ex existed contemporaneously with and yet not been able to meet uh, due to the pesky limits of space and time. So, but a bit. So up here on the top, this one, the sewing machine, the kitty cats, and that lovely lady. Those are all etchings. So they are done with, typically on black granite because the black shows up the etching very well. And it's either done with lasers or diamond tip tools, stroke by stroke by very talented and patient people. And it reveals all kinds of information. This is the Lee family farm. There's their farm, there's their silo, there's their farmhouse, there's their fences, there's their animals, there's their people. Which shows us what we did with ourselves for vocation. We worked for the ambulance company. We might've been an EMT or a paramedic. We served our country in the military. We created things, whether we use that sewing machine to make doll clothes for our grandchildren or make costumes or clothing for our families or used it as a vocation. And we also, I see a lot of people's pets on their gravestones and we love our cats. We, I see lots of dogs. I see all kinds of other pets because really as modern people, those pets are part of our family. This lovely snazzy lady in the middle, that form of picture is called a photo ceramic. It is a picture that has been attached by a process uh, an image that has been attached by a process onto a piece of ceramic and then sealed. And then you can see it's been mounted on the gravestone. So that is a, a beautiful picture of a beautiful lady. And then down here, that happy smiley lady is, um, she is an etching on black granite. I see the faces of these individuals and sometimes on their happiest days, like their wedding days or their anniversaries or something like that. And please know that having pictures of individuals on gravestones is not a new thing. Over here on the left, this gravestone for Frank has this cutout at the top. And I can't quite read the date because it's teeny weeny and my eyes are terrible, uh, but it, it is definitely a 19th century stone. And at one time there, there would have been a picture, perhaps of Frank on, inserted in that niche and then covered with glass in that gravestone. Uh, photography was invented in 1839 and it doesn't take very long to become some, to go from being something that was available just to the wealthy to being a, a technology that was readily available to many, many people at a, at a reasonable cost. So it, it's, think about it in terms of the evolution of your cell phone. It's the same kind of uh, process, evolutionary process for your technology. So when you find gravestones like this that have that cutout, know that there was some kind of picture, perhaps of the individual in there at one point in time, even dating back into the mid 19th century.
cemeteries, new life in our cemeteries, in our modern cemeteries. We do more than just walks in these places now. And this again is but a short list. We keep bees. It's good for the flora and the fauna, as well as we can harvest the honey and raise money for the cemetery. We, as strange as this may sound in New England, we can use these spaces as a dog park. Um, I think that Congressional Cemetery in Washington, D.C. is an excellent example of that. Owners pay a pretty decent amount to uh, sign up their dogs for membership annually, and they are allowed to run off leash. You are responsible to clean up after your dog, and they know it if you don't, and if you don't, out you go, because there is a waiting list. Uh, that dog park in, in Congressional has been it's very successful and a great stream of revenue for the cemetery for well over 15 years. You can have weddings and parties in the cemetery. You can go have dinner and see a movie. You can do daily yoga and have a, or participate in a 5K run. There are book clubs that take place in cemeteries and discuss cemetery topics as, as well as life and death talk, topics. Um, in the upper right hand corner, Shane, the self promotion that is me, your favorite gravestone girl, in our booth in Laurel Hill Cemetery, an art market that takes place in Philadelphia in the cemetery every year amongst the tombstones. And it brings more than 2,000 people through the gate between the hours of 12 and 5 at $5 a head. So, whammo, $10,000 in the kitty just from the entrance fees in, for this event. We hold death cafes in these places where we reacquaint ourselves with our mortality and the idea that life is circular, not linear, and that we will all end up possibly in the cemetery, but at least not always here on this plane. And then lastly, I wanna to point to technology, QR and mobile apps. So many places have mobile apps, many cemeteries have mobile apps that you can download and uh, use to take tours at your leisure. And certainly I used to have to explain what a QR code was, but then there was this pandemic thing and now everybody knows what a QR code is. So this is a QR code created by the Memory Medallion Company in Pennsylvania. They hold the US patent for using QR technology for memorialization and, and historic reference. So um, historic interpretation. So in places like the museums or or uh, antique homes and that kind of thing. But here it is used in the cemetery. It's about an inch in diameter. Here's an example of it down below, right there, embedded into a gravestone. You pay a one-time fee for your memory medallion. You get this QR code. And when you install this on your gravestone and then somebody like Gravestone Girl or anybody else that happens traverse the, to traverse through the cemetery, they they come along and they see your QR code and they scan it and you are going to end up here as an example, that QR code, if you scan it, will take you to Mrs. Sarah Buchanan's memory medallion site. So that memory medallion site has up to 999 spaces for you to put content, you can put pictures, video, your writings, genealogists, put your genealogy work out there, your future, your future descendants will thank you for it. And because she is the spokesmodel here, we read in the opening statement that shades of blue are her favorite colors and daisies are her favorite flowers. And it goes on to talk about her as a child. And there's a really great amount of content in here. But the thing that I think makes Mrs. Buchanan's memory medallion website um, that much more interesting is in life, she was known for her secret family caramel recipe. And in depth, she wanted to retain that title. So she did a 14 minute video and put it on her memory medallion site of her and her son in the kitchen creating the secret family caramel recipe. So I like it. I can go to the cemetery and I can learn to cook. Uh, I can meet people. I can commune with the birds and nature and broaden my horizons in all kinds of ways. I just wanted to make a little plug for upcoming Greystone Girls events um, this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. We are part of the Darksum Summer of Darkness virtual market. So you would find it on the darksumcraftmarket.com website. 
also landing pages and events on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I will actually be leading a live cemetery walk on Friday at two o'clock. So I guess that's tomorrow, two o'clock um, down in Dedham at Pine Grove, uh, a very early uh, pet cemetery. So get your tissues out for that. And if you shop with Greystone Girls over the weekend at our website, there's a 10% discount with code darkness at checkout. And we're also back on the road. Um, we will be at the Oddities and Curiosities Expos next month. Uh, August 14th, we'll be in Richmond, Virginia. August 28th, we'll be in Chicago, Illinois. So if you're out and about, come by and say hello, whether it's virtual or in person. And watch us. There's much more to come uh, as we move into the fall. So remember, check us out, gravestonegirls.com, Facebook and Instagram, Gravestone Girls. Uh, my job this evening, I warned you I could talk about this forever. I warned you I had a lot of content. So I would be remiss as a girl that lives in Worcester that does gravestone studies if I did not use the very famous and fabulous gravestone of Harvey Ball to close my program. Harvey Ball, the inventor of that very beautiful and very happy yellow smiley face that we all know so well. My job has been this evening to, to share with you that cemeteries are fun places, they're interesting, they're educational, and they are a valuable resource for information. I hope I have inspired you to get out there and explore. There's a little bit of daylight left, but you know, it's hard. There's a lot of trip hazards in the cemetery in the dark. So call into work tomorrow and go out and play. Weather's going to be great. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I am going to unshare myself. Wait a minute. I can't remember how to do it. I will, though. Right there, stop share. There we go. There we go. There's all my friends. How's everybody doing? I hope you're all awake. You all look like you're still out there. So um, we still have a few minutes and I'm happy to take any questions if anything's come through the chat, Libby, uh, or if you all wanna just go pour a cocktail and sit on the couch, that's fine with me too. Um, it looks like we've gotten a couple helpful links from, um, Deb, I believe. Great. Um, so you guys can all check those out and then, um, uh, let's see. Oh, a, a question did just come in from Michelle. Do you still do stone rubbing classes? I took one from, um, Asabet Valley and would love to do another one. Yes. Yes, we do. We don't have any coming up um, on the calendar. Uh, we'll usually do those with uh, library groups or historical societies, genealogy groups, but we also do private classes as well. So we can take a, a gaggle of folks out on a Saturday or Sunday morning or in the evening over the summer while we still have a lot of daylight um, and get you outside and teaching you how to rub, how to rub properly and safely. Um, and watch for, there'll be another acidic class in the spring. Great, great. How would you, how would you go about scheduling a private class? Uh, send an email to the girls at graystonegirls.com. You can do it right through the, through the website as well. Awesome. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot. Absolutely, great. And it looks like Kathy has raised her hand. Kathy, you wanna unmute yourself and ask? Hi. Um, there's a very interesting um, uh, gravestone in Walpole. It's of a bugler from the Civil War, a young boy. Absolutely. And the top of his stone is the his his cap and the bugle. And, and his bugle. And, yeah. and you know, we, we were doing this tour trying to find the Civil War monuments. And uh, so we're wondering how they could have done that on that. But now that you described the moles, it must have been done that way because it's three dimensional, like on top of the stone. So if it if it's got that blue gray cast to it, it could be zinc. And the test for that is go up and just knock on it. And if it returns a, a hollow metallic sound, it's zinc. Um, because they are they are the the monumental bronze ones, those those white bronzes are indeed metal. Uh, but it's entirely possible that could be a, 
a block of carved marble as well. And one of the things I managed to leave out while I was talking about those softer symbols of the 19th century um, is that marble became the dominant material because we can now get it from farther away. We have railroads, we have uh, waterways, we can get marble from, from states that are farther away. We can even get them from across the ocean from places like Italy. Um, we have a lot of workers coming here from Europe, uh, stonemasons uh, and carvers that were making, that were going to work making marble monuments like that as well. And it's very often with the Civil War ones, I'll see um, drummers, buglers, um, you might see cavalry that has the hat and the belt and the sword. Um, most of those I see are actually done in marble, but it's not impossible that it could be a, a white bronze, a zinc as well. So there would still be, there would be uh, professional people now who would actually do that three-dimensional type of thing on a stone if you wanted? Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, so shameless plug, on the Gravestone Girls website is a section called Learn. And then within that, we have a section for um, preservation. Uh, and it points to a number of our associates or a number of our friends that do gravestone cutting. Most of them are working in slate in that more in that tradition. Um, but there's certainly plenty of modern monument makers out there as well that work in marble, not just granite. Right. You, you can really, um, you can really, um, I really have it done any way you want. It is often a function of money, but one that comes off, uh, comes to mind, uh, they might be a little far away for you, but you can do a lot of the stuff initially online and on the phone is uh, Worcester County Memorials in Shrewsbury. They work in all sorts of different meetings. Great, thank you so much. My pleasure, anytime, thank you so much. Um, so Susan um, asked a question, what's the oldest cemetery you've been to and where? Woo, that's a good one. <laughs> How much time you got? So I would say in, in the United States, one of the oldest that I have been to, if not the oldest in terms of organized burial grounds with all those colonial gravestones that I was showing those uh, winged skulls and, and, and um, hourglasses and all that kind of stuff is in Charlestown just outside of Boston. Um, and it's called something like the old burial ground. It, it is full of amazing stuff because it has a, a I, it's got thousands of stones in, in a relatively small area. And many of them were made by a, a man. They did not identify him by name. He just, his, from historically, when we talk about him, we, we call him the old stone cutter of Boston. He's got a very distinctive style and he's doing, he's one of the first, if not the first, doing um, those wing skulls and there's lots of deaths, imps and arrows and, and hairy, scary and fabulous and wonderful and uh, many, many things dating well into the, the middle of the 1600s, 1670s, 1680s death dates. Uh, he was a very prolific carver. There also are a number of other documented carvers um, working in the Boston and suburb kinds of areas as well that are very well known in that space. So it was, um, it's a, it, it's absolutely one of the oldest that I've ever been into here in, uh, here in this country. And then I've been very fortunate to traverse many of them across Europe and over in Asia. So well beyond hundreds and hundreds of years and thousands of years before we got here in this country. And then um, she also added any paranormal experiences. Sorry to say not a one. I know I'm letting folks down when I tell them <laughs> that. Um, I'm like Fox Mulder from the X-Files. I want to believe, just give me some proof. Um, I think that if something did happen, I would probably run screaming like a little girl, right out, uh, right back out to that gate and may never set another foot in. So I guess fortunately it hasn't happened because I'm still going in there. <laughs> Anyone else? You need to type it in the chat or unmute yourself. 
Excellent. Well, if y'all come up right. with something later on, you know, you know how to find these, shoot us a note on Facebook or Instagram or through the website. We are uh, keep an eye on us. Ask us questions as you come up with stuff. We're always easy to find. Sometimes it takes me a little bit to get back to everybody's messages, but I'm always looking at them and I'm always trying to get back and, and keep discussions going. Well, thank you all for coming. And Brenda, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. And again, um, like I said before, to our friends of the Norfolk Library for sponsoring this. Absolutely. Thank you for having me tonight, Libby. And again, my, my thanks as well to the friends. A lot of my programming happens because of the friends groups of the library and the cemeteries and uh, friends groups for the, for the historical societies. It, it's those kind of volunteer groups that, that make these kind of programs possible. Definitely. All right. Well, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night. Bye.